Hello, I'm Peter Wilson, um, Director of Training for the Institute of Group Analysis and I'm very pleased today to be offering a lecture to the Diploma of Supervision in Supervision in St. Petersburg, Russia. Today's lecture is going to be on the supervision in the context and praxis of group analysis. Now Hannah Arendt, the German philosopher, famously described um, praxis as being the humanising of the process of wrestling with ideas, thoughts and feelings. And we can see immediately how this is directly applicable to supervision. Now Fuchs himself, the founder of group analysis, was always very keen on humanising the process of therapy. He did this by narrowing the distinction between the patient and the therapist. You can hear this in the quote, for example, from his second book, where he says, these neurotics are, after all, people like you and me. And part of our annoyance with them is that they show us our weaknesses in a mirror. Supervision, of course, a good supervision group, will act like a mirror. But in order to think about supervision in the context and practice of group analysis, I want to first offer some observations about the human experience of being in supervision with an individual or a group. I'm going to talk about the different Fuchsian or, or, or the Fuchsian or group analytic concepts and the different contexts in which supervision takes place. I'll offer you some considerations about what we imply by the word supervision and using some clinical examples think about the different constraints that arise as the context of supervision changes. So returning to Hannah Arendt's definition of praxis, supervision is undoubtedly the place where we wrestle with ideas, thoughts, feelings that emerge in our clinical work, particularly the feelings that we might consider or deem unacceptable. These might be failures to maintain an analytic attitude, failures to follow theory, to understand a patient, to spot the obvious, to empathise or even to care. These failures are, of course, all too human, and we know, theoretically and rationally, that their acknowledgement will ultimately help deepen and enrich our work. Yet, supervised representations are invariably filled with anxiety, with omissions, with unspoken thoughts, and with lapses of concentration. Now, experienced clinicians might use these omissions after the supervision, or these lapses to remind them of where their own personal current threshold of shame might be. It can help them consider what their relationship to their supervision group is or maybe their relationship with their patients. They might realise that the omission that they've, they've, they've posed in the supervision group is a result of a counter-transference or it might be the influence of a projective identification. And this can then return to the supervision group. Ultimately, though, I think many of these problems that are emerging when we're being supervised come from what Fuchs called the tyranny of the superego. And it's this tyranny that good supervision does the work of humanising. And we know from experience that the most effective means of humanising an idea, a thought, a feeling, is by sharing it. Incidentally, the word praxis was originally coined by Aristotle as referring to activity engaged in by free men. And this idea of freedom is in opposition to the notion of the irrational tyrant who imposes an idea, a way of behaving, just like the superego does. And, and the threat of, of, of not obeying these ideas is dire consequences, shame, isolation or punishment. Now, the concept of the superego, as we know, derives from Freud's original model of the psyche. It was one of the three structural pillars of, pillars of the psyche, the id, the ego, and the superego. Group analysis, Fuchs famously said, is ego training in action. The purpose of group analysis is to strengthen the ego, and in this way we can withstand the potentially destructive id-driven Im impulses, but also the harsh imprecations of the superego. Unlike Freud, however, Fuchs understood the ego as a transpersonal process 
And as he says in his second book again, the ego processes are, in my view, shared by the total group. They are analysable in the context of the total group interaction, by themselves and by the conductor. Now this statement, that the ego processes are shared by the whole group, is extraordinarily radical. And what I want to do is put it alongside another Fuchsian notion, which is that the group cannot be understood except in their relation to other groups. Now, in that sense, we can now begin to think about the value and importance of supervision groups. Now, a supervision group is analysable using all the usual group analytic tools and techniques. However, the change of context from therapy to supervision requires a different approach. What we have to bear in mind here is that there are also different forms of supervision. And each of these also requires a different form of approach, a different praxis. The different contexts I'm going to talk about here are the supervision of trainees, the supervision of professional colleagues and peer supervision. Now the different praxis or approach that we take in each of these groups can be related to the dual meaning of the word super, which is the prefix that we put before our vision, supervision. Now super can mean both above and or outside the group in this context. And this outside is similar to Fuchs's notion of the therapist being both inside and outside the group. Now, when we think about a traditional group analytic praxis, we think of it about a non-hierarchical, democratic, multi-perspectival approach. Analysts generally avoid asserting authority beyond the setting of boundaries. And in professional supervision or supervision of fellow professionals, it's possible to maintain this approach. However, when we work with trainees, it's a different context and therefore it demands a different approach. It confronts us with a challenge to our usual practices. It's not acceptable with a trainee group to merely wait and see what emerges. The group has to be organised so that the supervisor has up-to-date knowledge of what is happening. The it's the responsibility of the supervisor to ensure that he is aware of each member of the group and what they're doing with their patients. The supervisor is also assessed with, uh, charged with assessing the performance of the trainee, not only how they're treating their patients, but how they're performing in the supervision group. And I've just run out of my notes there, so I'm going to have to... So in this context, it's impossible to be anything but over and above the group. You are an actual position of authority and you have to use this authority and take it. Now, it's, it's possible, though, to some, narrow this gulf in, in, in authority by being transparent about its existence, by seeking to elicit the anxieties that emerge in the students. And by doing so, you can still humanise the experience. And in... In order to mitigate or mediate the superego position that transference and projective phenomena will undoubtedly amplify in these kind of situations with trainees, the group supervisor can be explicit or transparent about the reasons or justifications or thought processes that lead to any decision. The supervisor of trainees must also bear in mind that the experience of being a trainee, even for experienced professionals and clinicians, is necessarily regressive. That is, by being placed in the position of depending on experienced figures, the analysts and supervisors will almost certainly evoke transference phenomena. And it's important in this case that the supervisor remains open to information from the group that might alert them to their own counter-transferences. I'll give you an example of that. Um, a highly able student in one of my student supervision groups was promoted to acting manager on a nursing department. And a part of his new role, he was given supervision responsibilities for two teams of trainee nurses. Now, these trainee nurses were placed on two different wards. And my, my, my supervisee wanted to supervise both groups simultaneously, offer reflective practice groups to both groups and bring them to, the to, to, to my supervision group. 
Now, I was very much appreciative of this student's abilities and I was also aware there was a pressure on him to make, make a decision very quickly. But I was also concerned about the fact that he'd just taken a new job on, he was also doing the training and he'd also started a new relationship, he'd told us in passing. So we explored the practicalities at some length. And while I was concerned, eventually he persuaded me to give the green light. The following week, another member of the group described the two reflective practice groups as twins and said she was reminded that the trainee in question um, had looked after their twin siblings. The trainee then told us that parental illness had meant that he'd actually been a parent figure for these twins and that much of his therapy had been about resolving the resentment he felt about being um, a parent to his, to his siblings. I was immediately put on pause here and I started to worry that this was a reenactment of something from the past. And I said that I wanted to put my decision that he could go ahead on hold. The nurse was furious. He said that he'd already started taking steps to move on and that it was impossible for him to stop now. But I held my ground because the more he protested, the more concerned I became. Actually, a couple of weeks later, the trainee returned and spoke movingly how he recognised his tendency to take on too much. And he realised that he would have resented me if I had not stopped him from running these groups. The demands of his workplace had become more and more apparent and his management weren't thinking about his impossible workload. And he felt it was very helpful that I had actually put a stop to his tendency to pile more work on himself. Now, now you'll recognise that this was an instance of parallel process, or what we call parallel process, where the dilemma the nurse had experienced in his familial situation had been replicated in the supervision group. But I think it's important to point out that the experience also brought me to a realisation that how, of how much I'd relied on this student to help out with interpreting and thinking about the work of his less able peers in the supervision group. And I recognise that in this way I might have actually been colluding with a group reenactment of this student's problems. And I resolved at that point that I needed to be much more active in my supervision of this group, much more directive. Now, I suppose this is a good point at which to remind us that Fuchs' acknowledgement that neurotic patients are just like us tells us that our personal issues will always remain relevant to the work we undertake, regardless of how much analysis we've had. And this problem raises an interesting dilemma for the supervisor when supervising fellow professionals. Because supervising fellow professionals means taking on a slightly different role than the above, the authority role. Because it's my view that here we move into the idea of supervision as where you are both inside and outside the group, more like in a therapy group. The difference is that the professionals who are with you in supervision, they can immerse themselves fully in the supervision group in a way that you can't. This state of being outside or on the periphery of the group can be expressed in how much personal information the supervisor shares in order to explain or understand transfer transferential or projective mechanisms. And how much personal information a supervisor should share with colleagues is of course always a very delicate question. And the answer to this partly comes down to a lot of different contingencies which relate to the context of the setting, the extent and duration of the supervisory relationship, the experience of the supervisees and so on. Generally I find it safer to stay on the outside of the group and to encourage personal disclosure only when it's understood as having direct relevance to the work under supervision or something has become an obstacle to the supervisory process. In terms of sharing my personal feelings with regards to the work, I've found that when I work with teams in more extreme situations, prisons or forensic settings for example, these benefit much more from being able to share experiences of hate or disgust that are readily evoked by the material. And I think it's really helpful in these instances for the supervisor to take accept ownership of these feelings himself and, and recognise them as being very human and natural and to encourage their expression. But it's equally important that this is always with the aim of helping to explore and understand the inner world of the patient or the group who we're thinking about. Now, as I've said, in group analytic theory, clinical group supervision should be non-hierarchical and each perspective given equal weight, each view equal credence, each member equal attention. In practice, just as in real life, 
This will not happen organically. Rather than impose it though by, for example, dividing up time, it's the group supervisor's role to be aware of what when it does not happen, when things aren't shared properly, and to bring what does happen to the attention of the group. What are the implicit power dynamics operating in the group? Are there professional hierarchies being played out as sibling rivalries? How is this reflected in who group members look to for advice, for criticism, for support? And most crucially, what might the playing out of all these dynamics tell us about the clinical material that is being presented? So sibling rivalry, envy and competition are arguably most prevalent and most difficult to name when we get to peer group supervision, where unspoken hierarchies of experience, age, professional allegiances and conceptual biases are ever present, though rarely named. Now these kind of groups, peer groups, enjoy the freedom of siblings who are released from parental oversight, but as they also share the anxiety that such freedom brings. Now as peers from all members of these groups will invariably know each other and share current and personal, historical personal material, this will be understood as informing any clinical decisions or ideas that come forth. And for this reason, these groups can be incredibly valuable, despite the inevitable difficulties of holding the boundaries. Now it, it seems to me that in a peer group supervision, every member of the group takes responsibility for moving from both inside and outside the group, to take the inside-outside position. The motivations for doing this and when we do it can remain unconscious and defensive however and can enable the group member to feel like the most important, wise or experienced member rather than share in the vulnerability that exposure to others brings. And in this sense we could say that leaderless peer group supervision comes closest to the group analytic praxis which is when fully distilled simply the experience of being in the world or Dasein as Heidegger called it. This is an adult world where the challenge is to engage in a consistent church for the meaning that we create for ourselves both within and between us. It's a consistent working on relationships and relatedness that demands our focus and attention. Our shared care for the patients or clients we work with remains always the, the proper focus of the attention, but these groups remind us that no matter, again, how many years analysis we've had or how many years practice we've had, we're always going to be wrestling towards an unattainable perfection. A good example is I, I shared a peer group supervision f with, with a group of uh, colleagues for many years and there was one of my peers who regularly presented a particular patient, not the same one, as being beyond hope. Um, my colleague usually described the patient as acting out and worried about their own failure to find a way of constructively addressing it and they did so in such a damning way that we all, every time, found ourselves agreeing that the only option was for somehow to help the patient to leave. Again, several weeks or months later, when it became the, this peer's opportunity to present again, they would invariably tell us what a remarkable turn for the better this patient had made, and how the whole group now value this patient immeasurably. Eventually, one of us caught on that this was a pattern, and my colleague readily admitted that whenever a patient appeared about to drop out, he is felt with abandonment anxieties that quickly lead to despair. So the patient's acting out was immediately felt by this peer in a way that they couldn't manage except for when they got the support of us in joining them in that despair. And somehow this resonance uh, that we as a peer group held somehow got through to the patient that their communication had been heard. So I think it's really important that we don't act always on supervision but allow it to be a place where we can hold the feelings and thoughts that emerge. So. Just to kind of come towards the end of this talk, if we consider then that the group analytic praxis is ego training in action, and further we consider the ego to be a group process, it then becomes absolutely evident why we might use groups for supervision. The nature of being human appears to entail an eternal wrestling with thoughts, feelings and ideas that both assimilate and differentiate us. By submitting ourselves to supervision groups, we ensure that we remain alongside our patients in this arena, where involvement in the process is where we find our humanity. Praxis does make perfect. That's a play on words on the, an English quote that practice makes perfect. 
And when we think about practice making perfect, it depends on an understanding that the best we can hope for is to create special places, both therapy and supervision groups, where we can always continue to wrestle towards a freedom to share and explore our human imperfections. Thank you.